Minnesota Wild Development Camp welcomed six Minnesota natives this past weekend. And Minnesota Hockey Executive Director Glenn Andreessen explains how so many state of hockey born make it to the NHL. Plus, it's the Kirsten and Jesse off-season golf edition. As always, we're created by New Voice Studios, brought to you by Talk North, Olivia, Grain Belt, Jim Beam, and Royal Credit Union. This is Season 4, Episode 184. At Jim Beam, they know the importance of tradition. Like chanting, let's play hockey prior to the start of each game, or playing the state of hockey anthem after a wild win. This season, raise one to your fan family with the bourbon that invites us all to come as friends and leave as family. Jim Beam Bourbon Whiskey, the official bourbon whiskey partner of the Minnesota Wild and XL Energy Center. Drink smart. Jim Beam Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. 40% alcohol by volume. Copyright 2021. James B. Beam Distilling Company, Incorporated, Fairmont, Kentucky. Hello, everybody. What's up for the Bardo Beauties podcast? out here in Sock Center for the third annual ranch golf tournament. So excited to be a part of it. Uh, we also have Glenn Andreessen joining us later on in this episode to talk about all the cool things Minnesota Hockey's doing. We'll be out at their golf tournament tomorrow. Kirsten, how's your game? Uh, it's not good. Uh, I'm gonna good. Be, and we're just gonna cut straight to the point. It's yeah. not very good. Yeah. I'm here for the vibes. Um, I'm here, it's a beautiful day. My short game, pretty decent. Long Same. game, not a chance. Yeah. So it's going to be an interesting experience to see how it goes today. I have been golfing all summer. It doesn't mean I'm any good, right? It just means that I am getting outside on the golf course and, and working out. Uh, all in all, another great off-season hockey event. We just wrapped up the crazy game of hockey weekend. What an incredible weekend that was. I know you missed out. I, did. I didn't. I had a fantastic time. The whole world knows I had a fantastic time. It was great. Um, also coincided with the development camp. Got to see Charlie Strammel, got to talk to some of those guys, talk to Judd Brackett, Brad Bombardier to see where they are. Um, Charlie Strammel, you guys, big dude. Shoulders are huge. He's aware of the criticisms and kind of the expectations he has coming into him. But Kirsten, I think he's going to be great. Again, just seeing his sheer size in person, we've wanted big centers. They need, the Minnesota Wild needs to get bigger up the middle. Charlie Strammel is a guy that could do that in a couple years down the road. In the words of Taylor Swift, and I said this the night of the draft because I was so annoyed, you need to calm down. Um, wow. You've been, yes, it's true. Like, honestly, like the criticism that kid was getting after everything he's been through, after not even stepping on the ice in a while, anything yet. Yeah just getting drafted, hearing his name called. I think people were so upset because they were expecting to get Oliver Moore once they saw him continue to drop in the mm -hmm. draft. That was never gonna happen because Chicago still ahead of them. They were trying to move up. Yeah. No one was moving. Right. So I think there was a lot of disappointment with not being able to get him because people were talking about the high quality centers that there were. But like you guys, you can't complain about not having size and wanting size, then we get it and still complain. It doesn't work that way. I'm yeah. excited to see what he can do. Yeah, so we got to see, get a glimpse of those guys, Brock Paper, Sandy Walker. Also at camp, which I thought was really unique because those guys have spots, right? They have the experience, but they really brought that leadership in. You could tell that they really took hold for these younger kids, these 18 year olds, these 19 year olds who are entering their first development camp. Um, ultimately, all in all, they were out there showing their leadership, still excited to get back. They're still excited to be here and they have uh, some constant competition going on, which was also a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm kind of disappointed that I wasn't there to see it because just I'm very excited about this draft for the Minnesota Wild. My two biggest things were like, I want size, I want defensemen. They acquired a couple more centers than I would have thought that they would have, but I feel that they covered all of the areas that they really needed. So I'm pleased with it. I'm happy. I'm excited to see what they continue to do and how they develop. The other player that I was very excited about seeing at development camp, Danilia Yurov, who does not speak a lick of English. He is under contract in the KHL, but for him to come over to North America, you guys, still being under contract with the KHL, um, proves immense measures that he's excited to be a part of this Minnesota Wild organization. He said through his agent, who was kind of loosely translating, that Kirill Kaprizov did text him, did reach out and answer questions, and Danilo was so excited about that. You could see the smile on his face. We asked, are you friends with Kirill? And he said, no, but he was very excited to be a part of that. And and his agent said that Kirill is equally as excited for Danilia to come back here. It looks like he will spend one more year under contract with the KHL. And then the ideal situation will be he will be in North America with the Minnesota Wild the year after that. So that was another player, high, highly touted prospect that is going to do some big things for Minnesota, who's excited to be here. Plus another Russian that helps our little baby Kirill enjoy himself. Now, again, we are out here uh, benefiting the ranch. If you guys are not familiar with the ranch, it is Mark Pavlich's kind of 
brainchild uh, in an effort to raise awareness for mental health. Some great former players out here, great coaches out here. We saw Paul Martin walking around, uh, Kurt NHLer Nate Schmidt, also moseying through. So we'll be sure to check some check check in check in not check out. Uh, we will check in with some of them. Be sure to be following on our social media pages for those little insides and outs. Uh, but before we wrap up this week's episode, we've got Glenn and Dreesen letting us know how Minnesota hockey is doing, especially with a draft that saw so many Minnesota kids go a lot of them to the hometown team. Yeah, I'm excited. Great episode. Great interview ahead. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Some exciting news for you guys today. Not only am I down more than 20 pounds with my own personalized Livia program, you can be too and get 50% off during Livia's Livia days. Find out why it has been voted Minnesota's best weight loss program. Simply call 855-LIVIA or visit livia.com. That's L-I-V-E-A.com. 50% off while Livia days runs. Hurry, you don't want to miss out on this opportunity to look and feel your best this summer. That's livia.com, L-I-V-E-A.com. Let them know Jesse Pierce and the Bar Down Beauty sent you. We're back joining us now, Minnesota hockey's finest, Glenn and Dreesen, because we love to brag about the state of hockey. We love to talk about all the good things that are happening. None other uh, than you, Glenn. Glenn, talk about, let's start with the Minnesota players at the draft. 15 players drafted in 2023, and the Minnesota Wild seem to get in on that action pretty heavily as well. Yeah, that's kind of exciting. That didn't always seem to be the case where uh, we'd see so many Minnesota kids go to the wild, but uh, three, I think, went. And then uh, I actually got to meet a couple of them uh, today at the wild development camp. I think you did too, Jesse. So really cool to see that makes um, that, that makes it extra fun to cheer for them. But but we uh, we are always pulling for those those Minnesota kids and and just kind of another great year when it comes to the draft. I think. Um, I think there's been 10 or more Minnesotans taken in 18 of the last 23 drafts. And I think in three of those that weren't, there were nine. So, uh, so every year uh, Minnesota has proven that, that there's still some, uh, some great players coming out of here and, and a high volume of them. Well, even to go off of that a little bit more too, Glenn, I mean, you get to see these kids early on through the Minnesota hockey pipelines, like youth hockey, high school hockey, you name it, um, staying in Minnesota and then to be kind of called back. How cool is that? Just, I'm sure there's personal experiences you've had with some of these guys too. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it really is cool because part of my job is going around to our, our region and state tournaments every March uh, to watch these you know, peewees, 12 U's, Bantams, 15 U's play. And then, you know, you're just kind of watching the events, making sure they're going off okay. Um, but you do kind of notice players out there. You're looking at rosters, whatever. And then it is fun to go back at those programs, you know, those state tournament programs six, seven, eight years later. And you're like, oh, my gosh, like, look at this, some of these names that were that were in these tournaments for us. And so, um, so even today, you know, Aaron Pionk, from Hermantown and Jimmy Clark from Edina, uh, Charlie Strammel from Rosemont. Like these are all guys that were playing in our, in our youth state tournaments really not that long ago. And here they are, you know, preparing to, uh, to, you know, practice with some of the best players in the world and, and get ready for their <clears throat> upcoming seasons, whether that's in the minor leagues or, or uh, college or possibly NHL in the cases of like Brock Faber and Sammy Walker. So, so really cool. I'm mean, Faber is another one. I watched him win a Bantam state championship, uh, really his last game as a, as a Minnesota youth player. And so, uh, so yeah, Kristen, it's, it is awesome to just see, you know, <clears throat> where these kids come from and then where they go from there. I mean, and beyond the talent, you referenced Brock Faber and Sammy Walker, two guys who made a pretty quick impact with the Minnesota Wild last year, still attending development camp in the kind of these leadership roles and having had a chance to speak to them both last year and early on at, at camp here, their personalities and just the way that they carry themselves is so tremendous, which that's what sports are also supposed to be about, right? I mean, in Minnesota hockey, I think does a tremendous job because I couldn't think of a, a guy that's come out of Minnesota hockey that I've had a too tough of a time with. They're usually pretty much good character people too. Yeah. And I certainly we'd love to take all the credit for developing <laughs> great characters, but uh, parents and teachers and others probably have something to do with that. But I do think there is something to um, the model 
here in Minnesota a little bit in, in that um, these kids, as they grow up playing for their community and with their, with their friends, that, that probably does develop character a little bit. Um, I think these guys know when they, when they go out away from the rink, they're representing kind of their hometown and they're representing their hockey program and, and hockey players in Minnesota know that. And um, so, you know, I think a small piece of that could be attributed to the, you know, the hockey culture here, but I also think um, just there's these high quality kids that come out of here have a lot, um, have a lot of good people leading them uh, through their youth years or their parents, coaches, and like I said, teachers as well. And going back to talk about the draft a little bit more too. I mean, we talked about the players from Minnesota hockey drafted by the Minnesota wild, but even looking further than that, like Oliver Moore to Chicago. So what's it like to kind of see him spread out or even being taken in the first round? Like, just like I mentioned more was. Yeah, it, it is cool. And there were actually a couple of kids too. I thought might um, get drafted that didn't, but that's not always a bad thing um, because they can develop further in college and then really have their pick of, places they want to go uh, once they get out like Ben Myers from Delano did um, once he uh, finished up at the U of M but yeah I mean it's so cool I mean obviously all these teams from around North America are taking notice of of kids from Minnesota wherever they may be and um, I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to this stuff so I track all these guys um, not just when they you know, turn pro, but I'm tracking how they're doing in, in, co- in the college ranks as well. Uh, really every division one player from Minnesota, man or woman, um, we're kind of following them along to see how they're doing. And, and uh, so it's exciting. You know, we have the most, most division one men and most division one women by quite a bit. And so, um, so it just makes us proud to, to see all these kids represented so well all over the country, whether it be pro or, or college. Well, you had mentioned Ben Myers out of Delano. That program has really started to assert itself as a powerhouse. And you're starting to see programs pop up in different places. It's not just the Edinas necessarily. It's not just these schools that are continuing to powerhouse. What do you attribute that to? Obviously, it starts at the grassroots level. I mean, how do you think some of these programs are growing? And are there any other programs that people should be keeping an eye out for? Everyone likes to look at the state tournament. But as you said, it starts with the youth state tournament, too, to see how these programs are going to grow. Yeah, really good question. So Delano, I, I've always had a soft spot for because I do feel like they're a program that kind of came up out of, um, you know, we often kind of compare them to Hermantown a little bit in the 90s. You know, Hermantown was always there, but it just really kind of blossomed in the 90s and became what it is. And I could see something like that happening with Delano, you know, another program that um, there, there just wasn't a lot there other than a lot of really good athletes and then those athletes and their families started to get them into hockey. And so Delano is a program I think of a lot, but um, as far as programs that are really coming on, it's cool to see some of the older programs um, that were known for their success that maybe kind of lost a little bit of that are now coming back. And and the big one there is, is Hibbing. Um, both the last two years are Bantam and Pee Wee teams have been just phenomenal. I think they're going to be really tough to beat as those kids move on to high school uh, up in Section 7. So Hermantown is going to have, have uh, be given a run for their money, I think. Um, but, you know, just talking about, you know, there are there are once proud programs that have struggled. And, you know, I live in Bloomington, um, you know, where Kennedy and Jefferson were once, once these story programs and now they're uh, not as strong. So a lot of times people will point at those and, and say, well, that's kind of a sign of, you know, hockey's dying or whatever. And I often say to that, well, you know, 20 years ago, show me where hockey was in, in Lakeville or Andover or St. Michael or uh, Laverne, Minnesota. Um, all these programs that have, you know, completely become known for their hockey programs uh, for the boys and the girls. So um, Maple Grove would be another one. So, um, so yeah, hockey keeps growing. It just, like populations all over the state, certain pockets do well at certain times and then they might come back or they might fade a little bit or they might just explode out of nothing. And um, there's no real rhyme or reason to it. We just see that all over the state, which is cool. 
And I mean, even going off of that a little bit too, I think, I mean, yeah, it's, it's not ideal to see a program kind of dwindle, but at the same time to see a resurgence in a community where it was once so prominent to see it make that comeback and just kind of bringing new life and energy to it. It's gotta be, um, you know, kind of that silver lining there as well. Yeah. And that's, that's what you hope people want to be a part of. And that's where it starts is at those associations and you get the right people in charge of bringing new kids into the game, new boys and girls. And that's, that's really their focus is just how do we get more five, six, seven, eight year old kids to play for our association. And I can tell you, if you are successful in doing that, if you get a huge number of kids in that age group for three or four years, you're going to see the benefits of it um, six, seven, eight years down the road, as long as you can keep those kids together, make sure they're having fun and, and keeping them in the sport. So, um, so we have to make sure our associations have all the tools they need to do that. And, um, and, and it's gratifying anytime you see kind of new programs have success, you know, a new team make it to the high school state tournament for the first time ever. Um, that's always, always something that we can be excited about and take pride in and, I know we all have our teams we root for. You know, Jesse, you're always going to be a Matamidi fan, but it is good yeah. when we see other programs get into the mix and and start uh, competing for state titles. That only inspires little kids in their area to keep doing the same. And to be fair, I would have been okay if War Road beat Matamidi in that because that was one heck of a hockey game. That's all I really look, care about yeah. at the end of the day. One of the best, yeah. One yeah. of the best, but go Zeps. Uh, anyway, you know, you mentioned taking pride, and especially when it comes to numbers, Minnesota continues to lead the way when it comes to registration numbers and in boys and girls. How did that fare this year? Another consecutive year of Minnesota being on top amongst USA Hockey uh, affiliates? Yeah, yeah uh, we. I always say this, so I apologize if I'm going Apologize if I'm repeating myself, but yeah, we always, our biggest measurement is that eight and under age group. So those five to eight year olds that I mentioned and in Minnesota, we had our biggest year ever last year. We had over 19,000 eight and unders. Um, part of that probably attributed to being the, the post COVID year where a lot of people kind of held off for a year and then signed their kids up for hockey. So that was huge. Um, we're down into the high 18,000s this year. So it's still something to really be proud of still leading the country in that, in that respect. Um, and then on the girls side, you know, that number is in, um, you know, 5,000, I want to say 5,300 or 5,400, 800 girls. Um, so a fun fact about that, that total, other than two other states in the country, that Number of eight and unders is more than all other states have. Uh, all girls and women playing combined. So, um, so the fact that we're getting so many little girls playing hockey is is huge for us, and we'll we'll continue to see success. Um, you know, as those kids get older too, and and move on to college or national teams or whatever it might be. And that's, I feel like something I want to focus a little bit more on too. You talk about the growth specifically of girls hockey. What do you think has attributed to that? Just kind of the growth of professional hockey too, that girls in Minnesota have seen and realized they can do it too, wanting to get involved. Yeah, I think there are several factors in that. Um, I think the fact that there's, you know, I'm trying to rank what I think are the most important ones, but high school hockey would be up there. The fact that these girls have these high school players in their community to look up to is is huge. Certainly having these division one and division uh, three hockey programs in the state helps too. Um, you know, you'll go to, if you go to a go for women's game, you'll see, you'll, you're bound to see a bunch, a handful of little girls, youth teams there watching those, those players play. Um, so I think, that and then you know just the model that we have of community hockey it's easy for girls to start playing it's it's inexpensive it's uh it's right there every association has opportunities for girls and so um it's just much easier to get involved here than it might be in other parts of the country so i think all of those things factor into it um and now we're seeing you know where girls hockey really kind of got its start in minnesota in the 90s well, now a lot of those girls that played are now having kids of their own, girls of their own that play. Um, male hockey players have have little girls that play. And so um, so they've got great coaches. They've got great uh, 
you know, genes and, and people that loved hockey when they were young are now passing it on to their, their daughters. So, so girls hockey is in a great spot here, but we want to keep it going. Um, we want to grow it even more right now. It's about 33% girls to boys, um, in the state. And so we want to get that closer to, to 50, 50. Obviously you love growing in all aspects, whether it be disabled hockey, girls, hockey, boys, hockey, men, women, everything. What continue to be some of the main challenges you guys face in having that? And what are some of the offerings that you have extended in order to try to remove some of those barriers? I know I've always been admired you guys for, for all the uh, legwork you do as far as diversifying hockey and how serious you guys take that. But what are some of the other barriers that are keeping kids from maybe playing hockey year in and year out that you guys are facing and, and tackling head on? Yeah, I think the the biggest challenges are the perceptions that are out there uh, about hockey. And I think sometimes the perceptions out that of hockey are true if you lived in anywhere, any other part of the country besides Minnesota. I mean, hockey is an expensive sport. And I'm not saying it's not expensive here, but it is far less expensive to play hockey here than anywhere else in the country, you know, by thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, you know, the battles that we face are just, you know, as kids get into hockey and they start doing, well, we've got to do this, we got to do that, we got to do that, we got to do this, and spend all this money and spend all this time and we can't do anything else. That's an inhibitor, I think, to more people playing the sport because they look at it and see if if that's what it takes to for my son or daughter to become a good hockey player. I think we'll sit this one out. We'll figure something else out to do if that's what was required. But um, but I really think those are perceptions; they're not reality. And um, you know, as evidence of that, I, I look at um, the last four Mister Hockey winners from Minnesota are all from the northern part of the state um, where they don't have, you know, a lot of these pressures around here that we have in the metro area to do this, that, this, that, this, that. Those kids there that grew up and played up north, they're playing outdoors with their friends and then they're playing with their teams in the wintertime. And by and large, a lot of them are playing other sports in the summer. Um, say it louder this, because they, I'd like to continue to yell that at parents to play multiple yeah. sports. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And and that's a guy who's a hockey guy who wants kids to put down the hockey skates um, for the, the off season. So, um, but we're living in a time where, where fewer and fewer kids are doing that. We, we are kind of caught up in this, you know, fear of getting left behind. And um, so that's, you know, long answer to your question. I think that's the challenge is, is, um, trying to get people to understand that, Hey, just, just have your kid play hockey and have your kid play a lot of other sports. And, um, and then when you get to 16, 17, 18 years old, then pick your head up and figure out where you're at. Um, mm -hmm. cause a lot can happen from that time you put on the skates for the first time to the time you're graduating high school. My nephews are both playing hockey in the St. Michael Albertville, but right now my brother, who was a basketball guy, grew up a basketball, baseball, soccer, multi-sport athlete, if you will, is trying to get the boys to do that. But like you mentioned, I think there's a lot of outside noise that, you know, sells a bill of goods. Well, if your kid plays this AAA team, he'll probably make the A team come the fall. And I've been going toe to toe with him, Glenn, reminding him like that's a business. Those people are making money off of you doing their hockey during the summer months. It's not going to make a difference for my nephews who love hockey. I love to watch them love hockey, but they do love baseball and they do love the different stuff. So I know my brother's trying to struggle with that. I'm like, Hey, Rich, what did you do? He's like, well, I wasn't pro in anything. I'm like, this is true, but <laughs> if they are good enough, they will be found. And at the end of the day, it's just about having fun with your friends. And and I know that probably sounds like I've drank the Kool-Aid with you guys for far too long, but I believe it. You know, I think that's, the God's honest truth is, is multi-sport athletes go further in, in things sometimes than a specialized athlete. Yeah. And I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, my kids, I have two that, that play hockey that they completely let their skates collect cobwebs in the, in the <laughs> summertime. Like they do skate, they do some camps, they do some, some other things. So I, I get it. And, um, you know, part of that is just like, oh, well, maybe it'd be good to keep them skating, but you're right. They'd probably be just as fine if they didn't see their skates at all. Um, and, you know, and <clears throat> but they are active in, in other sports. They're playing tennis and soccer and flag football and all these other things um, in the off season. And I just, 
I hope they can do those things for as long as they can. Um, my nine-year-old daughter does does hockey and basketball in the winter, so that won't last forever, but why not <laughs> let it happen for as long as I can? Exactly. Didn't Paul Martin do that, or he took a t- break off from hockey to go play basketball for a season and then was like, I'll go back to hockey now? <laughs> Paul Martin probably could have gone pro in four different sports. He was, uh, <laughs> yes, he was a basketball player. I think there was a big celebration in elk river hockey when he finally decided hockey would be his thing but yeah he was a great basketball player football player and and baseball player so uh, we would love to see more paul martins out there and ben myers like we talked about was yeah. was one of those he was a three-sport athlete in high school and didn't seem to hurt him at all i mean i was a three-sport athlete just not good in any of my three sports really just kind of <laughs> very you know meh but i had a good time doing it pretending right. I was good you know that's yeah. how it goes uh Glenn before we let you go I do want to have you give a shout out to any of the programs that you have going on as the season starts to approach I know it's summer we're telling you to put the skates down but you guys do have a lot of really cool clinics and initiatives um including the uh never too late to start clinic which is one of my absolute favorites because I think in hockey people get so caught up in well if I wasn't on skates at age two I can't play and that's not the case. So tell us a little bit about the programs coming up as hockey season is just around the corner. That that would have been the one that I wanted to, to highlight. So thank you for, yeah. for mentioning the Never Too Late camps. So that starts next week. We do that in three other locations, three locations, Bloomington, Coon Rapids, and uh, St. Paul Highland. And that's one of the, my favorite things that, that we've started here where um, it's for kids age 9 to 13. If you're even a little older than that, you can certainly sign up. But it's an it's a four week eight session course for these kids that hey you know what I didn't grow up I didn't start when I was five six seven but I've taken an interest to hockey I've got friends that play and I want to get involved and we've realized there's a market for that people just need a place to go and it's really intimidating to to go just show up at your association if you're a pee wee or a twelve u and be like well I'm gonna I'm here to start hockey so these kids get in this camp and I can't tell you how much Going to that camp reminds me of why I love doing what I do Um, because we can talk all we want about NHL guys and division one men and women. And and that's all great. We're excited about all those kids, but this is where you just totally see you kind of fall in love with the sport again, seeing these, these kids try it, have fun. They're all out there with like a skill ability because they're all starting out and, um, and it just brings that innocence back. It, it kind of reminds you, like, this is why we do what we do. This is why hockey's fun. None of these kids are aspiring to be NHL players, but they they want to take up the sport and and be a part of this hockey culture that we have in the state. And so I get so excited about that program. It's got an amazing retention rate of kids that either sign up for association hockey or for our Minnesota Hockey Rec League in the winter. And so um, – so we're excited about going to three locations this year and and can't wait to see how many full-time players we get out of that. I mean, Kirsten, maybe that's where we should start. You know, I know they have some adult beginner leagues, but that's it's never too late to start because we are we are horrible, Glenn. We are some of those small percentage of Minnesotans that just can't do much. <clears throat> I can we need get... all the help we can get. <laughs> <laughs> I can get you guys a discount into those camps. Nice. So Shout out, say less. We love Which... a good discount. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Well, Glenn, thank you so much for joining us. As always, go to minnesotahockey.org. Check out all the things that they have going on as the season gears up. If your kid's not already signed up for hockey, give it a try. Give it give it a whirl. It's going to be a good time. I've got my oldest signed up for a little wild this year. Very excited to see him fall in love with the game that I, too, love. And uh, we'll catch you next time, Glenn. Can't wait. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks for uh, all you do for, for Hockey in Minnesota. We appreciate it. Thank you. We're going to take another quick break. We'll be right back. We're back. Thanks so much to Glenn Andreessen for joining us. As always, I love Minnesota hockey. You guys know that. Play multiple sports. I will tell you that from the depths of the earth. Um, Again, we will be out at Bunker Hills with them tomorrow, Tuesday, when you guys are listening to this. Um, And just having a good time. Being buttes on the course. It's kind of what we do now, I guess. Yeah. That's (laughs) it. (laughs) <laughs> I tend to do that a lot where Jesse says something and sometimes I forget that I'm supposed to respond. Mm-hmm. But no, it's a beautiful day, great event, really excited to be here. And yeah, great, great cause, beautiful day. Golf and hockey, can't go wrong. Uh, again, thanks to all of us who, all of you, you can, go ahead, go for it, you're good. 
<laughs> Thanks to every. Yeah. Here we go. Thanks to everybody who said hi this weekend. I know I ran into quite a few of you who are fans of the show, fans of ours. Always appreciate the support. Uh, always appreciate the support from our sponsors, Luvia, Soda Stick, Grain Belt, Jim Beam, Royal Credit Union, and Talk North. And again, you guys, you make it happen. You're the best. Hopefully we get some good content coming up soon. It's off season. I ran into J Jared Spurgeon over the weekend and he's like, I'll see you in August. And I was like, I'll see you in August. Cause it's coming that's coming quick. It's gonna happen. So have a great rest of your week. Great rest of your day. We'll see you next week.